Some things that are empty are not bad, okay? But you are born with an empty hole in your soul. And there's only one thing that can fill it, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. No amount of money can fill it. Now, I'm not against money. In fact, if you have something you want to give away, I'll be standing at the back uh, after the service. But no amount of success can fill it. No, No relationship with a human being can fill it. You are born to have a relationship with God. And yes, there are things that are empty in our lives, and there are going to be times that we feel empty, but because of the empty tomb, we can be filled because Jesus conquered death. And so today, we want to talk to you about that just a little bit. And uh, I, I remember the first commercial flight that I ever took. You ever flown before? Fact is, if you've never done it before or the first time you do that, it's a little nerve wracking. I I used to fly a lot. In fact, I used to average a couple of flights a week back when I was in evangelism. And I'm very glad those days are over. I did not like going to the airport. I remember one time I was sitting on the, uh, sitting in a seat on the airplane and there was uh, two or three people next to me and they'd never flown before. You said, how did you know that? Because they were talking and they said they had never flown before. They were also from Alabama. That has nothing to do with the story, <clears throat> but I found out that that's where they were from. All right. And this petite little woman, she was chattering. She was so nervous about taking a flight. And if you've ever flown before, you know that before they take off, they got to actually back away from the building. I mean, you don't take off through the building. You got to back away from uh, the terminal. And so she was looking out the window and uh, (laughs) we started backing up and she started freaking out. She goes, oh my goodness, we're flying backwards. (laughs) And her husband, I'm assuming it was her husband sitting next to her. He just old country boy. He goes, well, I be. All right. So uh, that was, I remember that was their first flight. But the first flight I ever took, I remember I was in my early 20s. I was a youth pastor and I was flying to preach at a church to a bunch of teenagers. I was so excited about the opportunity. But as a lot of people in their early 20s, I had an empty wallet and an empty stomach. All right. Uh, Young men especially seem to have empty stomachs quite a bit, right? You can fill it up and it empties out pretty quickly. So I was hungry and I didn't have any money. And I can remember nervously, you know, I'm trying to act like I knew what I was doing. I'd never flown before. And the flight attendant started coming down the aisle after we'd taken off. And she had delicious looking snacks. She was giving people drinks. And she would say, would you like peanuts or pretzels or whatever it that was that they were serving back in that day. And I'll never forget, as she came by my aisle, I was thinking that I didn't have any money. And I was thinking, there's no way. I'm very hungry. I'm very empty, but I don't have any money. I didn't have a credit card. And I was like, I'm just going to have to skip. So she looks at me. She says, sir, would you like something to drink and a snack? And I said, no, ma'am. Fortunately, the guy next to me was a veteran. He was a pro. He had flown quite a bit. And he recognized my nervousness. He recognized that I didn't know what was going on. And he said something to me that I think is very appropriate for what we're going to talk about today. He looked at me. He said, son, it's okay. It's already been paid for. And I want you to think about that. There are so many people that go through life empty. And they think that there's no way for those empty spots, that hole in their soul to be filled. And they try everything to fill it, fill it. And they do not realize that it's okay because Jesus already paid for it. And so today I'm going to read to you a passage of scripture that is not normally associated with Easter. We are celebrating Easter today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
But as you see, it's very appropriate, and I think that you'll get something out of it. It's from the Old Testament book of Job. Now, you remember the story of Job, right? He was wealthy, he was healthy, he was powerful, and life was good. I mean, life was good for Job. He had lots of money, he had lots of prestige, he was famous, and he had lots of power. But in one day, he lost everything that he owned. He lost all of his kids. He lost all of his power, and he lost his health all in one day. And as you can imagine, Job felt empty. He felt hopeless. He felt like there were no answers. Well, to make it worse, he had three friends that came by, and they began to ridicule and mock and tear Job down. You ever have a friend like that? Well, the friend like that, who needs enemies, right? I mean, the fact is, this guy, it was coming at him from all sides. And there was a guy, one of the guys there, his name was Eliphaz the Temanite. Eliphaz the Temanite. And we're going to read the words that he said to Job. He did not realize that what he was speaking would be recorded in Holy Scripture. And he did not realize the impact of the truth because of the way Job responded. And so I'm going to read in Job chapter 15, and we're just going to read a couple verses, verses 31 and 32. And this is Eliphaz, the Temanite, trying to encourage Job in his own way. Listen to what he said to him. He said, let him not trust in emptiness. He's talking to Job. Let him not trust in in emptiness, deceiving himself, for emptiness will be his payment. It will be paid in full before his time, and his branch will not be green. What an incredibly profound passage of Scripture. I'm going to read it one more time. I want you to think about it. Let it soak in because it's got such meaning for all of us. It says, let him not trust in emptiness. Do we not do that? Something feels wrong. Something feels unsuccessful. We get walked out on. We get hurt. We get stabbed in the back. We lose someone. We lose something. We lose a job. We lose material things. And we trust in emptiness. In other words, we think that's the way it's got to be. That's the way it's always going to be. It's never going to be better. We trust in emptiness. He says, deceiving himself. And we do deceive ourselves, do we not? And he said, for emptiness will be his payment. In other words, it's going to continue to perpetuate over and over and over again unless you find something that will fill that empty spot in your soul. And we see it all the time. There are people that think that with their money they can fill the emptiness in their life. But we know, while there's nothing wrong with money, we know that it can't be what brings happiness. I mean, how many of us have seen stories or heard stories of people that had lots of money, but they ended their life? They had lots of money, but they had more problems than anybody could deal with. That's not the answer. And others think that it's one relationship after the other. And they go from... Uh, relationship to relationship to relationship, thinking this is going to be the one. This will be the thing that fills my empty soul. And often even with good things, relationships are wonderful. Even with children, we think, boy, if I can just have a baby, that is going to fill me. And having a baby is wonderful. And God designed us that way. And if you want to have a child and you're able to have a child, that is a blessing from the Lord. But those that trust that child to be the thing that fills that empty spot in their soul are going to be disappointed. We make certain things to become idols in our life to fill a spot that God never intended for it to fill. He said, 
that emptiness will be his payment. It will be paid in full before his time. And his branch will not be green. In other words, you're not going to prosper. You're not going to have the kind of life that God wants you to have. And so today, as we talk about this, I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about how to have those empty moments, those empty spots in your soul filled in a way that God wants it to be. Here's the first thought. Emptiness is deceptive. He said that let him not trust in emptiness. You know, it will deceive you. Whenever you're going through bad times, is that not true? You feel all alone. And sometimes... It's a legitimate reason to feel alone. Maybe you've lost a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, maybe a parent, or, or something else. And, and these moments feel so desperate, don't they? But understand this, emptiness is deceptive. Why? Because of the empty tomb. They deceive us. Uh, they make us feel that we are alone. But listen to what Deuteronomy 31 verse 8, the Lord himself will go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will never leave you. So those moments that you feel all alone, those moments that you feel that you've been rejected and dejected and that there is no hope, God says, I will be with you. You're not going to be alone. He will never desert you. So don't be afraid. And don't lose hope. Isn't that the way many of us live? We lose hope. We get to a point where we think that there's no need to go on. What's the point? We we lose every way we turn. There's no way to win. God says don't lose hope. Why? Because he's with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Uh, The deception of emptiness sometimes makes you feel like you don't have meaning and purpose. But the good news is this, you do have meaning and purpose in this life. John 10, 10, these are the words of Jesus. He said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Some of the devil, your enemy, the thief, the liar. He lies to you. He's the father of lies. And when you begin to listen to his lies, that you have no value, that you have no reason to be here, that what you do doesn't matter, that uh, there's no way that you're going to be able to get out of the predicament that you're in. When you begin to believe his lies, when he tells you you have done too much, you're too far, there is no way for you to be back in a relationship with God. That is a lie. You got to reject those lies and believe what Jesus said. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. God wants to bless your life. He created you for a purpose. He created you for a reason. There is a reason that you're here. What you do does matter. Don't think for a second that God is not aware. He's aware of you. He's never forgotten you. He knows where you are. He loves you more than you can possibly even fathom. And so don't trust in the deception of emptiness. Here's the second thought. Emptiness is destructive. He said emptiness will be his payment. Isn't that an awful payment? I mean, the fact is, he says... If this is what you're trusting in, rather than Jesus, if this is all you're looking at, rather than Jesus, then what's going to happen is emptiness will be your payment. In other words, it's going to keep on perpetuating itself. And before long, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have no hope. I'm not lovable. Nobody's ever going to care for me. Uh, Everyone hates me. Everyone rejects me. There's nothing that I can do that's right. And what happens is, just like what uh, Eliphaz said to Job, what happens is emptiness becomes your payment. And everything that you do, when you don't keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, it becomes self-fulfilling and self-perpetuating. Um, it, when you 
live this way because of the destructiveness of emptiness, it'll knock you off the path that God has for your life. Listen to what Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs. He said, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Isn't that true of so many of us? Even in a relationship with God, often what happens, a person gets saved, they have a right relationship with God, they're filled with joy, they're excited about what God is doing, and before they know it, just like in the parable that Jesus said, there's some people that the seed gets choked out by the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this world. What does that mean? Well, it means that life will rob you if you're not careful. The cares of this world. Uh, you have to have cares. You have to have a job. Uh, you know, you get these bills in the mail. I know some of you get them by email, but maybe you can ignore it in email as well as you can in regular mail. But these bills that come, if you don't care, then what's going to happen? You're going to get your power turned off. You're going to get your car repossessed. You're going to get kicked out of your house or your apartment, and then you're really going to care, right? And the fact is, the cares of this world can dominate the affairs of our life. The pleasures, nothing wrong with pleasure. God created us to have pleasure. It's sinful pleasure that separates us from God. But certainly nothing wrong with you enjoying life. How many like the beach? Raise your hand. You like going to the beach? I love the beach. How many of you like the mountains? Raise your hand. I love the mountains. I just love vacation, all right? Maybe you're that way. You said, well, do you take vacation, pastor? I absolutely do. The church gives me so many weeks of vacation. If they'll give me more, I'll take that too. <laughs> Nothing wrong with pleasure and the riches of this world. He's not talking about something that is going to take you away. He's talking about your job. He's talking about the things of life. How many of us started out with a relationship with God? We started out serving him with all of our heart. Loving God doesn't mean you have to be at the church seven days a week or read 10 hours of the Bible every day and pray for 24 hours a day. That's not what it means. But you had that relationship with God. And before you know it, you got knocked off your path. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. You see, emptiness is destructive. It'll also knock you off your purpose. God has a purpose for your life. You don't want to miss it. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, then Christ will make his home in your hearts. Talking about those that receive Christ, those that become followers of Christ. As you trust in him, it's by faith. It's by faith, not by your works. And your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. I love that metaphor. In Psalm 1, it talks about those that meditate on the law of the Lord. It says their, their uh, roots will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It just grows deep roots. Let me tell you, I've lived long enough in life, and I've been a pastor long enough in life to know this. You need roots. You need something that's going to help you during the storm. Back in January, a tornado hit where we live and it blew trees into our house and into our yard and destroyed a, a lot of things and uh, what I know is that there were some trees that were snapped in half there were some trees that were uprooted but there were some that had deep roots and in the middle of the storm they were okay and can I tell you that when you and I grow down into the love of God. Isn't it interesting that he didn't say grow down into rules keeping? Now, don't get me wrong. I believe there are certain rules that everybody should keep, all right? Uh, for example, we don't live by the Ten Commandments, but I think it's a pretty good idea that you obey thou shalt not murder. Don't leave here and say, well, the pastor said we don't have to obey the law because it's God's grace. And then you go steal something, you're going to get your butt put in jail. Okay, that's what's going to happen. 
But he didn't say grow it down into the law, but he said grow it down into God's love. And when that begins to happen, things begin to change. He said, and that you may have the power to understand. There are a lot of things in life that would be better off if you just had a little bit of understanding. Now, I have to warn you, for those of you that want every I dotted and every T crossed and every question answered before you give your life to Jesus Christ, you're going to be sorely disappointed. I, I do believe the Bible gives us answers, but I don't understand why for a lot of things. I don't. I do know that God has given me understanding to know that I can rest in his love. No matter what happens physically, no matter what happens financially, no matter what happens to our family, because that I've sunk my roots deep into the love of God. You know what can happen in my life when I have trials? I can have a little bit of understanding. I may not understand why, but I understand that God loves me. I understand that he would never let anything bad happen to me that was not for my good. And then he says, when you do that, uh, as all God's people should, you know how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. In other words, it is infinite. You can't get away from it. May you experience the love of Christ. I think there are a lot of people in this world, even Christians, they know in their mind that God loves them. They believe John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And they would say, amen. Some of them would even put John three sixteen at a football game where they would get it on the television screen. I was driving down the road the other day and I saw somebody that had John three sixteen out on a sign. And it's one thing to believe that God loves the world. It's one thing to believe that Jesus died for the world. And it's another thing to believe that he loves you. You see, so many people, they believe the Bible. They believe Jesus died and resurrected from the grave. They believe that God loves people. They just doubt his love for them. And the reason they do is because of their circumstances, the emptiness. Maybe they haven't sunk down roots. And he said, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life. Wouldn't you like to have a full life? Wouldn't you like to know? Now, does it mean that you'll never have a regret? Does it mean that everything's going to be perfect? But man, when you have that relationship with God and you sink your roots into his love, then emptiness will not destroy you. Emptiness will not deceive you. He said, you'll have fullness of life and power that comes from God. You ever wonder why some people can stand in a storm? Well, it's not them. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is our anchor. <laughs> and you know what? The anchor's job is, the anchor's job is to hold you. You don't hold it. And you can be in the middle of that storm and feel like that things are out of control. And you can know because you know the love of God that the anchor holds. It's going to hold you. He's going to be with you. And then emptiness can dominate. It's deceptive. It's destructive, and it can dominate your life. And that's what happens to so many of us. And it says, and his branch will not be green. In other words, it's just going to keep on perpetuating and continuing in your life until you do one thing. Here's the thing. Job answered later. I want you to see that emptiness, number four, directs us to our hope. Now, here were these friends of Job. He was in the middle of a crisis. He had lost everything. He had reason to be depressed and discouraged and to stop. But I want you to listen to the response that Job gave these men in Job chapter 19, verse 25. And this is the point of everything that we're doing here today. Job said, I know 
that my Redeemer lives. Job was in the midst of a crisis. Job was in the midst of loss. He had lost family. He had lost all of his possessions. He had lost his position. He had lost his power. But there's one thing that he did not lose. There's one thing that kept him going. There was one thing that filled that emptiness in his soul. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you today that you and I are going to have empty spots in our life. We're going to have empty times in our life. And that's natural and that's normal. But if you're going to survive the storm, you've got to do what Job did and look to Jesus Christ, the Son of God who became man and he died a death that we should have died on a cross. And he was buried in a real grave. But thank God he got up out of that grave three days later. And you and I can say, I know that my Redeemer lives. When you have an empty bank account, don't worry, your Redeemer lives. When you have an empty nest, don't worry, your Redeemer lives. When you feel lonely, don't worry, your Redeemer lives. When you have loss, don't worry. Why? Because I know that my Redeemer lives. And that's why Job found hope. And I got to be honest, that's the only way you and I can have hope. I'm talking about real lasting hope. Hope doesn't come at the bottom of a bottle or at the bottom of a bunch of pills. Hope comes from Jesus. And, And what you and I need to learn is that we can find hope and fill those empty spots in our life because our Redeemer lives. Amen. I want to have prayer with you today. And really just a couple thoughts. Do you feel empty? We all do from time to time. There's nothing wrong with you if you do. But if you allow it to deceive you and to destroy you, it's going to keep on happening. And there's a way to break the cycle. I know my Redeemer lives. So today when we pray, maybe if you're a Christian and you got that empty feeling, lack of purpose, feel like you're a failure, feel like you're too far gone. Can I just encourage you today in the name of Jesus? You're not too far. God knows where you are. And you're making the right step today to be here. Why? Because I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. Maybe you're a skeptic today and uh, you need answers. I'll be glad to talk with you afterwards. We're going to have a prayer team over here uh, to my left, to your right at the end of the service. You go talk to them. They'll pray with you. Maybe today you're not sure of your relationship with Christ. Can I encourage you today to pray a simple prayer? Understand, these are not magic words. These are words from your heart. These are words of faith that cry out to God. And God promised that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, not if he's in a good mood, not if he doesn't remember what you did yesterday. You call on him. God promises to save you, to change your life. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head today. And if today you need to receive Christ as your Savior, people all across the world are praying this prayer today to receive Christ. You say something like this, Dear Jesus, I got an empty spot in my soul, but I believe that you can fill it. And I believe that you're the Son of God and that you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And Today, I'm asking you to save me. Today, 
I'm giving my life to you. Today, I want you to know that I'm turning my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.